Uh, welcome to our <clears throat> Sunday morning um, sermon. It, it is for October 15th, 2023. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. And a lot of things to pray about today. Chris and Jackie um, and uh, Hans and Becky, they are having uh, babies due soon. Um, looks like Chris and Jackie are going to have a C-section uh, scheduled soon. So be praying for the health of the baby and the health of Jackie there. And uh, for Becky, as she's doing a couple weeks, be praying for that. Continue to pray for um, Katie's mother, Billy. And she's, uh, as a recording of this, is in the hospital, still waiting on colonoscopy results. And uh, Joe Alexander's also uh, in the hospital with some medical issues. And uh, just pray for the doctors as they uh, uh, continue to um, work on his health and uh, get it better. Uh, and there's other... Uh, prayer requests that are unspoken, um, and uh, so be praying for the health issues within the church and those who are more private and quiet about it, so we just want to pray for that. I continue to pray for this world, for our country, for the um, uh, turmoil there in Israel and uh, Ukraine and other places. Just continue to pray uh, for God's will to be done. We'll talk a little bit about that, but not much today, but uh, we do want to pray for those situations. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We do um, bring these prayer requests to you, those uh, uh, towards the end of the pregnancies, those with health issues, those going through uh, surgeries and other types of things for uh, Joe and, and others. And we just pray for them. We pray for Katie's mom. And Lord, just pray you have your hand upon uh, uh, this study today. And uh, Lord, it's one that we can resonate with, and uh, especially in the turmoil of the world today. Lord, it's needed. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so Colossians chapter 2, we're only going to cover seven verses today, but there's quite a bit in these seven verses. <clears throat> now, Paul is writing the Church of Colossae and also um, Laodicea, which is there, and, and other cities in, around it, and trying to encourage them. Uh, basically, that Jesus is everything Paul has said he was. Now, Paul says, I, I've not seen you face to face. So he's writing to a church that probably Epaphras had something to do with, uh, with this church and leadership, whether he started it or not, we don't know. Uh, but his main message has been, uh, if you look at verse 7 of chapter 1, as you also learned from Epaphras, our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf who declared to us your love in the spirit. So this is a church that, that is off to a, a decent start. And Paul says in verse 9 of chapter 1, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. So this is a, a book about knowledge. It's a book in which Paul is praying that they will continue to gain knowledge. And we talked a couple of weeks ago about verses uh, 15 through 20, where it says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. And we talked about all the things that God is, that he is Lord. He is God. He is the mediator between man and God. He is Christ. He is Savior. He's Messiah. He's all those things. Uh, and he is to have at the end of verse 18 of chapter one, to have preeminence. Um, and so um, in him, all the fullness of everything dwells. So then in verse 21, Paul, we talked about this last week. Paul said, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. So he went from who Christ is to who we are. Uh, and we talked about those verses about the fact that we need Jesus because uh, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And so. At the end of verse, chapter 1, in verse 29, Paul says, let's look at verse 28. He says, Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. Verse 29, to this end I labor, striving according to the working which works in me mightily. So Paul says it's a striving. He is striving to make Jesus known, to make the, the Lord known known so that people at the end of verse 28 says in chapter one that we may present every man perfect in christ jesus paul's goal is that every man 
would come to know the Lord. Uh, that's not going to happen, but it's a good goal to have. It's a good end game. Um, so he gets to chapter two and he says, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So there's three cities here, Laodicea uh, and Colossae being two of them that he is concerned about. They're all kind of in the same group. And he says, I have great conflict for you. And now we're going to notice that there, there's nothing specific in these in this book that they're really doing wrong. But what is happening is there is false teaching coming in. Philosophies of man, uh, a teaching called Gnosticism, which is very complicated, but basically it's the, that Gnostic is from knowledge. And it's the idea that in order to get to God, you've got to have some secret great knowledge and that, that God is, is different than the gospel would, would say. And that a select few that have this great knowledge and philosophies. We see that in our, our realm today with uh, the, the high um, regard for, for atheistic philosophers throughout our history and atheistic science and atheistic professors and atheistic. Remember, the Bible says a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So anybody who comes from the start where there is no God or Jesus isn't Lord or Jesus isn't who he says he is, um, and so they're in this area where, where some of the Greek mythology is creeping in. And then within that mythology has been some, some teachings about Jesus that are not correct. And so Paul is, is concerned uh, for this church. And he says he has great conflict. Now, that the word conflict there is the Greek word agon, where we get the word agony from. If you go to verse 29 of chapter 1, he says, I, I strive according to the work in which he works in me mightily. The word striving is also agon. And so this is an agony that Paul has. And, and really to understand the agony, uh, we have to read 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, which says this, In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, and often in hunger and thirst, in fasting, often in cold, dark, and nakedness. So Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, is describing what he's gone through in his ministry. 2 Corinthians, his motives are being challenged. His reasonings are being challenged. And Paul says, look, at here's what I've gone through. And he talks about in being beaten and being arrested and being jailed in verse 27 toil and, and sleeplessness. And he describes all of these physical challenges that he's had. But look at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. It says, besides the other things, what, com what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. So he says, the physical things is one aspect of this ministry that I'm involved in. But the mental is something else, and that comes upon me daily because I have a deep concern for all the churches. Now, picture Paul. He's never seen face-to-face, -face, if you look at verse 1 of Colossians 2, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So this is a, a body of believers that has grown apart from Paul. Paul's ministry is spreading. Those he is ministered to are taking the gospel to other places. And he's in prison. Communication is, is slow. He's heard of the false teaching creeping in, but he's not there. Remember, Paul's a very passionate man. Paul, we see his passion in the fact that, that him and Barnabas wrestled over whether to take John Mark with them on missionary journeys. And Paul insisted that he not go. Paul is the one when he, he knew he was going to be at Ephesus for the last time, preached all night long until the young man fell out the window and he continued to preach because he was so passionate to get this message across. And so imagine him in prison. This communication with all of these churches is, is very slow. It's taken by hand, written in, in letters. These letters then become the scriptures that we read today. 
And Paul is unable to get to these places. Travel is tough. Plus, he can't go anywhere anyway. And so he's agonizing over the, 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 the potential of them falling away from the Lord. And as he talked to the Galatians, you've turned so quickly to another gospel. And we can relate to this. If, if we've ever had loved ones, family members, uh, church uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, who have walked away from God or, or, or fallen into a false teaching or not received the gospel. And when we pray, it's a pray of agony. It's a pray of striving. It's a pray of conflict, you know, and, and uh, when we pray for lost loved ones, you know, it's like, Oh Lord, draw them back to you. That's a good prayer. Obviously we want to pray that. But on the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, what will it take to draw them back? Uh, will they have to become like the prodigal son as his father, I'm sure, prayed for the prodigal son, but the prodigal son had to lose everything and, and eat with the pigs. And, and that drew him back to the father. But the father's waiting there with the fatted calf. But what a conflicting prayer. So this is where Paul is. It's, it's an agony. And, and if you look at the church of Laodicea and you read Revelation 3, they had their church in Revelation that became the lukewarm church. I think they're cold, cold and they're hot. So Paul's concern for them was valid. And, and there was a, an evidence that they did fall away from their fervency of God. And so Paul is, is agonizing in prison over all the churches. But in this particular case, especially the church of Colossus. And so he writes to them. Uh, having never seen them. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1.18, it's an interesting verse. It says, for in much wisdom is grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So the more we know about God and salvation and, and creation and the fall of man and the need for salvation, and we look at this world that is, is being torn away from God, uh, we see this, this turmoil in the Middle East between uh, two factions that have both rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It, it agonizes us. Oh, if they just knew Jesus, if they just trust him, if they just turn to him, uh, what a world this would be. Well, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, know this in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep in the household, making captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the Bible talks about the last days, all of these tumultuous things coming to be. And that this gullible nation, this gullible world would turn to the lust of their eyes and lust of their flesh and their pride of life. And we see it happening right before our very eyes. Romans 1 uh, completely uh, becomes apparent to us. And we cry out and say, no, this is wrong. You know, killing babies is wrong. War is wrong. Murder is wrong. Violence is wrong. And we agonize. This is why Paul had no recourse. But in, in Colossians 1.9, for this reason, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray. What else can Paul do but write his letters and pray? And sometimes that's all we can do is communicate the truth to whoever will listen and then pray that the truth will be received. And uh, because of that, we'll be called all kinds of different names and, all, and, and accusations as if we are the ones who are the hate speech and we are the ones that that are phobic of this and phobic of that and none of that is true we agonize over the need for this world to turn to the one who created them 
Jesus Christ himself. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and by him were all things created. We are all created in the image of God. And within you is a knowledge that there is a God out there. And we turn him into all kinds of different things, karma and justice and this God and that God. But the truth is that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to God except through him, John 14, 6. That's the truth. And this is what Paul is agonizing over. And I call it the agony of the faith, knowing. And so he prays. And as he prays for this church, who's in a pretty good state right now, but they're surrounded by philosophies and false teaching and mythology. And Paul is concerned that they're going to fall for some of this false teaching. It might be the same concern you would have sending your child off to a secular college and the things that they're going to be bombarded with that are anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-truth. And so you pray for that child. And Paul prays. And what does he pray for? One, verse chapter two, <clears throat> that their hearts may be encouraged. So he prays for encouragement, but this is a different than, than just a, a normal, hey, come on, you can do it, be encouraged. Right in the middle of the word encouraged is the word courage. So he's praying for them to have courage, to be encouraged, and, and, and that courage will allow them to stand against the wiles of the devil, putting on that whole armor of God. Uh, we're going to get more into the, the details of philosophies. If you look at verse 8 of chapter 2 in Colossians, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, but this is what's happening. There are philosophies and teachings that are incorrect coming in, just like there is in the world today. And he prays, oh, that you would be have courage in the midst because what's going to happen is the truth is going to be in the minority. Very, There's a narrow gate that leads to righteousness that very few go in. And that truth that is Jesus Christ, you're going to be in the minority. So it's going to take courage to take a stand against what the sheep are all following, what the world all accepts, what the media tells you is right, what Walt Disney tells you is right, what the world tells you is, is right. It's going to take courage to stand alone for the truth. So he prays for them that you would have courage. Uh, then he says, being knit together in love. So he says, the second thing I want you to do is I, I just need to love each other. Because that's where encouragement comes from. John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. And that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There's a lot of violence in the Middle East, and, and, and uh, that violence is, is not of God. Uh, the Bible, the truth, teaches us to love our enemies, teaches us to love those who persecute us, to, to feed those that are hungry, even though they are enemies, and to give our enemy drink when they are thirsty. And so the truth is uh, the Christian realm comes from the idea of love. And if the body, the church, is not loving one another, we don't look any different than the world who's filled with violence and hatred. Then he says, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. So he says, well, I want you to fully understand that you have the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, that you are saved. John, 1 John 5.13 says, These things I have written unto you, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, and that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Some of this false teaching out there is that you can lose your salvation, or that if you... If you're a Christian, you are sinless, and if you sin, you must not be a Christian, and all kinds of, of doubts, because we're flawed, and, and you know, I'm, I have no doubt 
that I am a Christian. I have no doubts that Jesus Christ has saved my soul. I know for a fact that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm qualified to be a preacher, um, but I know that I'm saved. You see the difference? And so um, do you know, I asked you this question that was asked of me years ago, if you died today, do you know for sure that you would be in heaven with Jesus Christ, absent from the body and present with the Lord? And do you know that if Jesus returned today, that you would go with him, meet him in the air? If you don't, remember the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, you will be saved. I was driving one day and got almost hit by another car. And I stopped and I didn't honk the horn. I'm not a horn honker. But I remember thinking in my mind something not very nice about this driver who almost hit me. Uh, and I immediately, by myself, confessed it to God. I said, oh, Lord, forgive me. That was a very bad thing. And my thought, that was a very, uh, he probably didn't see me. And so I asked God to forgive me. Well, I realized at that moment that that was complete proof of my salvation. You see, I confessed a sin that only God saw. And, and I didn't break any of man's laws. I can think whatever I want to. And, and it wasn't a horrible thing that I thought, but it was a, <clears throat> you know, you rotten driver. Watch where you're going. But it was an anger. And so I confessed it. Well, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, well, that confession of my sin to the one in charge proves that I believe he's Lord. And then it says, if you confess with your mouth, this is Romans 10, 9, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart he's risen from the dead, you'll be saved. Well, I'm talking to him in that moment. So that little flawed moment of mine was also concrete evidence of my salvation. Nobody was around. I was all by myself. Uh, if my Christianity was phony or not real, I would not have even thought about a God who heard my thoughts. But I knew in the guilt and the Holy Spirit's conviction. But even though it was a negative moment for me, it was a positive moment for my assurance. So he prays, are you sure? If not, go to God. If you confess with your, uh, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So sometimes we try to prove we're saved to God by doing works, when really what we want to do is go to God and say, God, I need this blessed assurance. But I will say, if you're talking to God by yourself, asking him for that blessed assurance, if you didn't believe in him, why would you be talking to him? Do you see? And then he says, may you have the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. Now, we talked about this in a couple of few weeks ago. The mystery of God is that, that the Holy Spirit and salvation comes to both the Jews and the Gentiles through Christ. It's either Junian or Greek. This is brand new to the world at the time Paul's writing this. That the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, and remember that mystery is Christ in you, and so that, that the Father and the Son are both the same. It's all the things he talked about in, in chapter 1. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we're going to camp here for just a second. In Jesus Christ. So he prays four things. Uh, be courageous. Be encouraged. Number two, love one another. Number three, um, I want you to have the assurance and understanding of salvation. And number four, I want you to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In this treasure, he says, and, and this is the problem. In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We talked earlier about philosophers and writers and professors. And frankly, if they're not a Christian, then they, they don't have any idea of how the universe works, 
of the fundamental truths. You might know about weather, you might know about science, and you can glean some, some intellectual things from, from scientists and professors, um, maybe not philosophers who kind of spout their own meanings of life. Uh, but if you really want to know about science and know about history, know about archaeology, know about philosophy, know about marriage, know about finances, know about all those things. These are hidden in Christ. But hidden is this idea of, of if, if it's attainable. If they're treasures, it's what he calls it. Here's what Proverbs chapter 2 says. It says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my command, so if you incline your ear to wisdom, apply your heart to understanding. If you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her wisdom as silver, search for her as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding of this universe is all there in Christ. And all you have to do is cry out for it. You have not because you ask not. If, if I told you that somewhere in the front lawn of the church was buried a million dollars, well, we would be digging, we'd have shovels, and you'd work all day to find that million dollars. And God says, my wisdom is available to you if, and if you will search for her as silver and search for her as a hidden treasure, but if you're lukewarm, if you don't care to know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come with him and sup with him. Revelation 3. Well, Jesus isn't forcing it. It's right there. In fact, he wrote it in the book. 66 books of the knowledge of God right in front of us. Proverbs 7, 1, my son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. So this book should be the center of everything we look at. You should look at the whole world through the lens of Scripture, whether it's our finances, our marriage, uh, our, our studies, anything we do. There, it's, trust me, it's in there. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that your heart will be also. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2. The heart is deceitful and, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So Paul says in Romans 7, I serve God with the law of my mind. Within this book, within this scripture, uh, we have the knowledge of the universe by the creator of the universe. And Paul prays that they would have all the, the, the knowledge of the mysteries of God. And, and it's incredible things. Uh, and, and it's physical, social, financial spiritual, all of those areas of life. And yet we spend years studying man's ideas and man's philosophies. And we'll talk about that next week. Um, so Paul is concerned that if this church does not grow in these four areas, that they don't have courage and they don't have love for one another, they don't have that assurance of their salvation, and they don't dig into the knowledge of God, that they will become vulnerable of these false teachings that come in. Look what he says in verse 4. Now I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Here's my concern, that there's going to be some persuasive people, and there are some persuasive people out there who write lots of books and have lots of eloquent speeches that are not biblical. And we have to know the truth in order to spot the flaws in, in other teachings. He says in verse 5, For though I'm absent in the flesh, 
Yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. I, I, I'm so pleased to see right now there's a good order. Your faith in Christ looks to be on point. But please, keep studying. Love each other. Know that you're saved. And be courageous when false teaching comes and stand and encourage one another. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. We don't want to fall for the wisdom of the world that goes opposite of Scripture. Even though 90% agree and follow that teaching and follow that, that belief system, we have to have the courage to say, no, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus instructs. And you might have to stand alone. That takes courage. Why? 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, The time will come, will they, the world, will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So here is, is this idea that false teaching is coming. It's always been here. The very first thing Satan ever said to Eve was, did God really say? Got her to think of a different teaching, a different philosophy, a different reasoning. Did he really say this? Do you really think he meant that? And the Bible is being questioned. The truth is being questioned. Um, I live my life solo scriptura. That's a old Latin term that means scripture alone. Everything is, is every mistake I've ever made in my life has been opposite of what God has taught me. And any success that I've ever gained is because of God's instruction in my life and, and me stubbornly following it. It's not about myself. It's all about this book, this scripture. It is enough. It is enough. Jesus is enough. In him, the fullness of everything dwells. All the wisdom is good. If you look back at verse uh, three again, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everything you need is right there. So Paul says, I'm writing this to you because I'm concerned. There's some strange teachings out there. And I don't want you to be turned by persuasive words. He says in verse 6 of Colossians 2, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, walk in him. So now you're doing pretty good. Stay walking with the Lord. Don't stray. Don't be turned to and fro by every new wind of doctrine. Rooted and built up in him established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Be thankful for, for God. Don't be uh, lukewarm as Laodicea became later on. Stay strong in the word. The foundation is Christ. This is a church. They, they had salvation. Paul wasn't accusing them of, of like the Galatians turning to a different gospel. They had good order. And that foundation is Christ Jesus. The wise man built his house upon a rock. And that's Jesus. But you have to build on that foundation. In fact, um, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. This is some pretty incredible verses we're about to read you. It's a whole sermon in itself. And it's verse 5. He says, For this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, so there's a growth process here. Faith is salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. So you're there. You're on this place of salvation. Foundation built. Another foundation can be laid except Christ Jesus. 
but add to your faith virtue, that is, is morals. To virtue, knowledge. Know what God is teaching. Study. To knowledge, self-control. Once you learn what God wants you to do and doesn't want you to do through your knowledge, then you have to have the self-control that comes from the Holy Spirit to do these things you're supposed to do and stop doing the things you're not supposed to do. To self-control, perseverance. It, it, we do stumble and fall, but we continue to persevere, pressing towards that mark of the high calling of God. To perseverance, godliness, then you become more Christ-like, more, more like God. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. There is faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that kind of becomes the, the pinnacle of spiritual maturity. So we continue to grow, add to our faith. But look at verse 8 of First, Second Peter 1. For these things are yours and abound, and you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that word knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Digging for it like treasure. For he who lacks these things, this is important, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So let's say you come and give your life to Christ. And then through the philosophies of deceitfulness of the world, you decided, I don't need church anymore. So you just stop going to church and you start engulfing yourself into the philosophies of man and the the ideas of man, and you become, you know, this this kind of woke character of of, of all of these uh, social issues and all of these things. Um, and then it says you can be see once you're saved, you're always saved. But if you refuse to grow, the Bible says now. I didn't write this. It says for he who lacks these things, for a computer one nine is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old. Sometimes you can just forget because you don't go to church, you don't study, and you don't, don't, don't do the things that are necessary for growth. And so uh, it's important that we grow and, and rooted. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So let's close with one more thought. He tells us in verse 7 of Colossians 2 to be rooted and built up in Jesus Christ. So, so what does it mean to be rooted in Jesus Christ? Well, this reminded me of John 15. So let's look at John 15. And I'm just going to read through a few verses and we'll be done. Verse 5, very familiar verses. I am the vine, and you are the branches. So there's the root. There's the foundation. You can. Jesus gives all kinds of illustrations. Build your life on the rock, foundation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the cornerstone on which we build everything. You've got to grow. You've got to build. And you've got to be connected to the root. Jesus Christ, I am the vine, he says, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's your choice. I can do all things through Christ, Philippians 4.13, or I can do nothing without him. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. It's a clear picture of hell. If you're not connected to the root, of Jesus Christ, the vine, if he is not your savior in which he is feeding you with that spiritual things. If you're not a Christian, you'll be separated from God forever. But if you are, verse seven, if you abide in me, salvation, and my words abide in you, scripture, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Why? Because you'll be asking according to the will of God. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I have loved you. There's that love again. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. If you love me, do what I say, because I'm telling you the right things to do. My philosophy, my teachings, my wisdom is right. 
These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. When you are connected and rooted in Christ, the result is joy, love, joy, peace, gentleness. These are the fruit. You'll bear much fruit, but you've got to be connected to that root, which is Christ, the vine that is Christ. And you've got to continue to grow and abide in him and abide in his words. Then you'll bear much fruit. And God's ultimate goal is for your joy to be full. That's what it means to be rooted in him. How about it? Are you rooted in him? Have you built your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ? Maybe you're saved, but you're just not growing. For some reason, you're not studying, you're not praying, you're not spending time in church. Or maybe you're just doubting it. So if you're having doubts and your assurance is, is struggling, study. Just, just read the word. And, and read the book of John. That's where I would start. Read a proverb every day. Uh, just have a time, even if it's 15 minutes, in which you are completely dedicated to reading the Word. Get a nice devotion, a one-year Bible. Get all kinds of great things you can do. Bible Gateway is a great site on Scripture. Blue Letter Bible is a great app you can go to with good lessons and studies. Um, Find a good church. Listen to these sermons. Go to church. Hear them live. Fellowship with Christians. Um, we encourage you to do that. Um, if you want a fellowship this Sunday, we're having a little potluck after church. Um, and uh, well, every three months we do that. So, so grow. Growing is key. If you do not grow, you become stagnant, lukewarm, like the Laodiceans became in Revelation 3. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this study. Help us to grow in Christ, to be steadfast and immovable from your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, next week, we'll discuss how the, the specific philosophies work, how they really distract you, and we'll get to the, the nuts and bolts of everything next week. All right, God bless you. Have a great day.